Tel Dan in northern Israel at the foot of Mount Hermon, and it's very tragic in light of what we learned about Jeroboam in our homework last week. This is where one of the golden calves was placed by Jeroboam and demonstrates such a departure from him trusting God. You're also looking at a high place. A high place was like a platform, a stage. You could dance on it, and if you placed an altar there, you could make sacrifices on it. And I wanted you to have a picture because high places are mentioned so much in scripture. I wanted you to see it so that we could translate it from this place into places in our life where we're going to step on a platform or step on a stage. It's an elevated place. Keep that in mind. And what Jeroboam did was he placed a golden calf on this platform. He not only did this here in Tel Dan, but also in Bethel. You know, a lack of patience positions us to depart from God's ways and manipulate things that we want. Anytime we depart from God's ways, we depart from fully trusting Him. When I was in my early 20s, I had a boyfriend that lived across town from me. And you know, what started out as just kind of a simple justification to sometimes let him sleep on the couch eventually led to full-blown sin. As I look back at why I made this departure from God's best that I knew was wrong, there were several reasons. I lacked patience. I got tired of waiting until we were married. I liked having him with me and I got tired of saying goodbye. I got tired of trusting God for the future that I wanted. And I just decided to take things into my own hands now. But this decision that I justified, it only multiplied heartbreak upon heartbreak in my life. I can honestly look back now and see this one decision led me to making other decisions that demonstrated such a lack of trust in God and a whole lot of trouble in my life. The downside of that season of my life is that it led to sin, which had consequences. And honestly, it had consequences that I wish to this day I could go back and redo. God's grace and forgiveness have certainly brought about redemption, but given another chance, I definitely would have made different choices. We probably all have made decisions in moments of not wanting to wait on God and making decisions to take things into our own hands rather than trusting God that we wish we could go back and redo. But I bet you can also look back on those times like me and see that those seasons of life provided lessons that warn us from making those same mistakes today. While I can still be forgetful and impatient at times, I can still try to manipulate situations like I want them, I've learned a lot. As a matter of fact, just this week, I had a situation where I had to make a choice whether to follow what seemed like kind of a silly, unnecessary rule or take things into my own hands and rush the process of getting what I wanted. No one would have really known if I broke this rule, but I would have known. It was a clear test to see whether I wanted what I wanted more than I trusted God. Trusting God could have meant that I lost the opportunity I wanted, but not being patient and not trusting God would have meant that even if I got the opportunity, I would have to live with the reality that it was my doing and not God's blessing. And that's a heavy cloud that would have quickly overshadowed the joy of getting the opportunity and could have actually made the opportunity so tainted that there would have been a complete lack of joy altogether in the end. You know, that's how I identify from departing from trusting God. I have this little checklist, going where God told me not to go, looking at something God told me not to look at, partaking in something God told me not to partake in, saying things God told me not to say, being impatient with something God told me to be patient with. For example, instead of trusting God with your desire maybe to go after a significant assignment, maybe you try to gain a quick sense of significance by name dropping or making sure people know about your accomplishments. What gives us a quick hit of importance short circuits the security of real worth. You only feel as validated as the last compliment from others. And you or I, we can quickly start impatiently chasing praise, chasing people pleasing and cravings to be valued instead of patiently following God and trusting Him. 
The sad thing is, a true sense of worth can't ever come from other people. Only God can give this. But when we get caught in the cycle of distrust, this cycle of manipulation, isn't it tragic that God is the last one we tend to seek? In our study last week, we can see this playing out in the life of two kings, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, and Jeroboam. Rehoboam should have been the king of all of Israel, but then when the kingdom splits, Jeroboam becomes king of the northern tribes. And if you haven't done your homework this week, it might be a little confusing, so definitely go back and unpack that. First, let's look at an example of a lack of patience a lack of humility, and a lack of true trust in God in the actions of Rehoboam. Like I said, the kingdom would ultimately be divided and torn away from Rehoboam. But let's take a closer look at some of the details in Scripture in 1 Kings 12, 6 through 11. This passage helps give us indicators of possible motives of distrust. 1 Kings 12, starting in verse 6, Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. You see, being a servant does not seem what Rehoboam wants to do. He takes the advice of the young men that grew up with him and probably wouldn't stand up to him and incite him to treat his people with increasing cruelty. Notice what these men tell Rehoboam to say in 1 Kings 12 verse 10 b. My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs, or some translations say waist. Now this may seem really odd and something none of us today would ever dream of saying, but in the ancient world to be larger or thicker was a sign of wealth, status, and power. It was all prideful, bragging things that he trusted and that made him feel quite self-reliant. The ultimate consequence of doing this his way rather than God's way would be the division of the kingdom. Now we know this because after Rehoboam makes life even harder for the Israelites, they rebel against him. They stone Adoram, the taskmaster of forced labor, and Rehoboam jumps into his chariot and flees to Jerusalem. While Rehoboam continues to be the king of the southern region, Judah, the rest of the kingdom is ripped away from him, and Jeroboam is made king over the rest of Israel. Now, don't miss this. Because of this situation, Rehoboam is now king of only the southern kingdom, and Jeroboam is now made king of the northern kingdom. And while I'd love to tie a big, beautiful bow around Jeroboam and say that he did everything right, I can't do that because we also find him exemplifying distrust and departures from God's ways. Jeroboam had such an amazing opportunity to be a very faithful king for Israel. After all, God had been so faithful to him. God saves him from the hand of Solomon. He gives him prophecy of the inheritance of the kingdom, and then God proves his faithfulness by actually making him king. If I were Jeroboam and all these people were recognizing God's faithfulness in my life and kind of looking to me as the it guy now, I'd really be feeling good and I'd really be feeling thankful. But feeling good and being thankful to God don't always go hand in hand. The next scriptures we read in 1 Kings 12, 25 through 33, are filled with examples of a lack of patience and honestly, spiritual manipulation and a departure from the destiny God intended for Jeroboam. Now remember why we're here in Tel Dan. This was one of the altars that Jeroboam set up as an alternate place of worship. He doesn't want the people he's now leading to go back to Jerusalem and start following Rehoboam, who is in Jerusalem leading the southern kingdom. This is so important. 
What Jeroboam is doing is practicing replacement theology by replacing the time and the place of worship that God ordained and established. And even if they did go to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, well, they were still invited. Come on back. Also worship at Tel Dan because the time was changed to be exactly a month after when the Israelites were supposed to go and worship at the temple. In other words, so the people who still did go to Jerusalem and worship at the temple there, when they came back, they had an opportunity to enjoy this place. It was crazy. God did not give Jeroboam permission to do this. He made it all up out of his own fear, deceit, self-promotion, and ultimately self-protection. And don't we do the same thing? We aren't satisfied with God's timing, so we create our own timing. We don't trust the places that God is going to take us, so we navigate our own path and create our own places. Okay, now let's read the text in 1 Kings 12, 26 and 27. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. That little phrase said in his heart, it may seem insignificant, but for the Israelites, the heart, in Hebrew you say it, lev, was the source of the will. This wasn't just an emotional response. It was a willful, deceitful decision. What he's doing to the people is manipulating them. He's leading them to believe he's following God, but he's not. He's leading people astray because his own heart has been led astray. He cannot possibly properly lead people when he can't even lead his own heart first. What he should have said in his heart is, I'm going to let God lead my heart. I'm going to stay true to trusting and following God. But that's not what happened. He spoke to his own heart instead of asking God to speak to his heart. Then, as he leads the people, he gives this appearance of serving the Lord. But in reality, he's really just serving himself and his agenda. This is spiritual manipulation. And the spiritual manipulation doesn't stop with the building of the temple and placing the golden calf. He names his sons after the sons of Aaron, giving the appearance of the priestly lineage. All these actions go against God. Honestly, I know this is a lot of history and a lot of Bible insight, but it really challenges me to lean in and to pay attention for myself. This is one of the pivotal lessons where we get to see where trusting God rises and falls, and it's with our will. Ultimately, we make the decision to trust God or to not trust God with our will. Do I want what I want, or am I going to choose to obey God? Often when we read stories in scripture, we can recall earlier examples of humanity's repetitive patterns. And honestly, I think it's important to pay attention to these because if it was a repetitive pattern in that day, it's probably a repetitive pattern in this day. For instance, Jeroboam's placement of the golden calves brings to remembrance the idolatry of the Israelites in Exodus 32. I imagine the Israelites honestly started to just get impatient with Moses. Moses had been up on that mountain for so long. It was time to take things into their own hands. And here's the deal. We fear the unknown. We do not know how to deal with the unknown. And when this happens, we lose trust and we take circumstances into our own hands. It's what we do today. It's what the Israelites did with the golden calf while they waited for Moses. And it's what Jeroboam did in placing the golden calves and setting up alternative places of worship. They were doing exactly what we talked about earlier that indicates a departure. Remember that little checklist that I talked about? They were going where God told them not to go. They were looking at something God told them not to look at. They were partaking in something God told them not to partake in, saying things God told them not to say, being impatient with something God told them to be patient with. 
and the consequences for Jeroboam were severe. Though he started out with such promise, in the end, he's listed as one of the most evil kings of Israel. While King David was the model often pointed to with good kings, Jeroboam becomes the one pointed to in reference to the evil kings. And the way the king goes, the people go. The people willfully give up their relationship with the living God for false gods. And the consequence, it was catastrophic. The people become just as empty as the false gods they keep turning to. Much later, the prophet Isaiah unpacks the reality of the worthless nature of idols that man creates with their own hands to reflect themselves. Isaiah 44, 14 through 17 says, He cuts down cedars, or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak, and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar, and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my God. Then let's also look at Isaiah 41, 29. Behold, they are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their metal images are empty wind. Ultimately, what this passage points out is the danger of spiritual manipulation and worshiping solutions of our own making. And isn't that what all these idols represent? A departure from trusting God happens because we think too lowly of Him and too highly of ourselves. However, when we think highly of God, we think rightly of ourselves. Not too high, not too low, but just right. Then we are free to simply trust God and enter into His desire for us to experience the goodness, beauty, and security of His presence something that idols of our own making can never achieve. Let's close today looking at Jesus, the King of Kings, how he modeled for us to remain close to God even when we're afraid. When Jesus taught us to pray, one of the first lines of the Lord's Prayer is addressing the will and keeping our focus on God's will to be done, not my will, not how I think situations should turn out, not my suggestions or even solutions of my own making, but instead daily pursuing God's will and verbalizing my trust in Him. Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven.